Okay, welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you saw an email from uh, uh, our department secretary about 4.30 when I was panicking because I quite literally had uh, a glitch isn't the word, um, <clears throat> a technical meltdown of some kind. It had nothing to do with my computer or anything I was doing. There was some switch of some kind that occurred. I won't Give, bore you with the details. And the gist of it is I couldn't log on to my faculty cubby, which of course means that I could not have sent you the email to give you tonight's meeting information. And uh, so I had to go through <clears throat> her on the phone and her husband, who's a te tech quiz, and they just figured out a different route for me to use from now on. I don't know why suddenly halfway, two thirds, three quarters of the way through a semester of uh, the college would change the a path, the route to get onto our faculty cubbies, but they did. And I didn't know about it. Then let me admit uh, Leah here. Okay, hang on one more. <clears throat> okay, so tonight we have, as you may have noticed, if you had a chance to look at the syllabus, <clears throat> only five must know slides. I actually should make that six, but I promise not to add because uh, in other semesters, even as recently as spring of this year, I had six for week 16, six must knows. We'll keep it to five. And the good news for all of you, and imagine you've been, if you have been attending the last couple of weeks, this has uh, now become the normal practice for the remaining weeks here. I think we'll do the same thing next week, which is that we don't need to go to nine 25, 9.35, we can end early, even before nine probably. Certainly tonight we should be able to. If we don't take a break and we just go through all the must knows, but then I would like to suggest that it's entirely up to you. I have some slides that I don't think you'll ever see anywhere else. There, uh, I took from the top of Notre Dame. No, they didn't let me walk up and around the roof and you know on top of the building proper, but from the towers. There's an observation platform, uh, and that's 200 feet above the streets of Paris. And uh, that was an experience I'll never forget. I got to spend a couple of hours up there hearing the bells, and I'll explain how that, in fact, I'll show you what they look like. The huge ones, the ones that are so big that if you ever saw any of the film versions, either the Disney cartoon or the live action ones of the hunch back of Notre Dame, uh, you might know he, according to the novel, of course, was based on a real character, but he was fictional in, in the novel. Jumps on top of one of the bells and it's so big he can ride it, you know, even though he's a full-grown adult, back and forth until it starts ringing. And he's deaf because of it. Well, I know why. <laughs> uh, believe me, if you ever have that experience, you will want to cover your ears before it starts. But anyway, we'll, we'll see that in the last 20 minutes or so, maybe less. And still end early, so I hope you'll stick around for that. But the must-knows shouldn't take us more than about an hour and a half. First, a couple of announcements. Okay, so now I'm gonna to go to speaker view. Uh, let's see, hmm, there we go, I just have to, yeah, okay. And move this out of my field of vision. All right, so um, I have received, I think all of the second papers that, well, I definitely have that were turned in on time and a few late ones. And uh, I have graded all the ones that I got on time, not all the late ones. But as it often happens, my readers have a life, family. <laughs> and yes, I know we're not supposed to get together, but you know, if they did that in their own way as safe, socially distance <laughs> gathering, they did none of them. Not, I have three readers and none of them uh, had started grading the papers I sent them early last week yet as of yesterday so they promised me they will get them done in the next two or three days but my real uh, realistic expectation it'll be the weekend like friday maybe friday that i have all the grades my philosophy i've t said this before with the previous two assignments for all my teaching and all the years i've been a teacher at every college i don't like giving some people their grades and not others for those who turn them in on time you should get your grades at the same time. It just doesn't seem right to have some people sit there and go, ha ha ha, come I didn't get my grade back when the so-and-so or half the class or whatever, more than half got them and I didn't. Uh, I never felt good when that happened uh, in classes I took at UC Berkeley or anywhere else. So, so I'm gonna wait till I have all the grades submitted. And of course I double check my readers work. I you know, don't just 
log them in automatically to make sure. And sometimes they add a few points if they miss something, which isn't very often, but it does happen. So once the grades are, you know, completely logged in, uh, I'll send you an email. It'll probably be Friday, maybe Saturday, hopefully no later than Saturday, in which uh, you will be reminded if you want the grade and a summary of, of how you did, that is anyone who didn't get an A. You got an A, you know you did everything, pretty much everything correctly, but anything less than an A, uh, I can explain what you missed. And that will be what I did for the past two assignments. Uh, that will be within probably 24 hours of, see, of your sending an email to my AOL, please keep it to AOL. Because that was the one thing I thought was not going to malfunction, and that did too, but it's, uh, oh well. Uh, okay, a word to the wise. Actually, this, this is relevant. According to um, the art department secretary's husband, who teaches at the JC, has been there 20 years, almost as long as I have, he teaches mechanics, but apparently that overlaps into being a tech quiz, because he, he figured out the problems that neither I nor his wife, the art department secretary, could figure out what was wrong. Why couldn't I log on to my own when I could yesterday? You know, and I, my password's not expired. I, I don't know what the reason was. But he said to tell all my students this. He does. Uh, I, I've heard this too. You have to um, empty your history or I don't know if it's delete, but there's something you can do with any server and our servers, most of us teachers here use, of course, Firefox. But I actually switched to Chrome. Uh, what does it matter? Whatever server you use, they do fill up. I'd never done that and it never was required or needed. I never needed. So you might, if you're having glitches, you might try that. And then of course, reboot, sign off, give it to three or four minutes and reboot. And hopefully that'll solve the problem, which is what happened for me. All right. For the second paper, if you didn't turn it in uh, at this point, there's no extra points off. It's just 10 points off if I get it any time before finals. I cannot accept late work after the final exam. In fact, you really should turn it in, as the Silva says, by the Friday before, but I'll, I'll certainly accept them up until, say, the Monday before the final, which is two weeks from tonight. And, and that's when we will have our last meeting. And it's just the exam. So when we're done, we'll finish early that night. Uh, you'll be finished for this semester. Uh, that gives you also two weeks. I probably will extend that through the Friday of final exams. In fact, I already said that last week. So at least through the end of final exams week for you to do extra credit. If you want to do extra credit, nobody's maxed their extra credit out, but a few people have, have done maybe 20, 25 points and some people won't need more than that or even need that at all. But there are people who could benefit, who if they do all 50 extra credit points will end up raising their grade. Uh, from a C to a B or a B to an A or, or, or in that vein, a whole letter grade. And so it does help you to do that as a cushion, depending on how well you do on the final, uh, which I cannot leave posted through Sunday. I've got to start the grading on the weekend. So uh, probably Saturday, uh, I will take it down from YouTube, like I did the midterm, <clears throat> although I left that up through Sunday of that weekend. I can't do that this time. The grades are due the week before Christmas. And I think you want your grades on time when you're applying for colleges, four-year colleges or, or, or scholarships or, or whatever other, just for your own use. So for me to get them in on time, I need uh, all the exams to be completed, even if you didn't <clears throat> see it in real time on YouTube uh, and then set. By, I'll send you an email, as always, and remind you of this, okay, uh, to only my AOL, because there are some issues also recently, as I think I said this last week, with some of people's uh, files, I'm talking about the files themselves, not the emails, coming through Outlook being blocked. I don't know why. So to avoid that problem, everything you want to submit for credit, extra credit or assignments, uh, including the final needs to be through my Mark W at AOL. Okay, any questions anybody has about anything I just said about your grades or extra credit or making up for perhaps a late paper or two or uh, some people, I, not many, but a few people haven't even sent me their first paper. That's, that's not very many. But those people, if that applies to anybody here tonight, you need to really kind of, like I said last week, get cracking because you've got two weeks to, to, to finish. Okay. Oh. I I think it's appropriate for me to tell you briefly, and then I'll send you an email as a follow-up. I was going to do that. That's what I was trying to do when I got booted out of the entire college website. So um, 
I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys. Um, there are five. The easiest one, well, let's say the one worth the most points and the, the, the quickest is to, hello? hello? Oh. oh, I'm talking about the YouTube video of the exam only. And that would be the final. Um, I'm going to have to think about it. I think I'll leave it up through Saturday because I know some people work. I have plenty of students I know who work more than 40 hours a week. Um, <clears throat> and I understand and respect that. But one way or the other, sometime between Tuesday, the 15th, and the following Saturday, you should be able to turn it in, even if you miss the actual live time. We want to go back and check your work as you have, uh, because at the option to do that, as you did with the midterm, right? Because it's an open book test, <sighs> obviously. <laughs> uh, so, so Saturday, uh, I'm not sure if I'll say, you know, midnight, I, I might want it a little sooner. So I'll send you an email, but, but that gives you through the end of the week and maybe even several hours on Saturday. It wouldn't be before, say, 6 p.m. on Saturday at the earliest. Uh, that would be the, let me do the math, 15th, 16th, 17th, 19th of December, because I have to turn the grades in. I think it's five days after that, <clears throat> all the grades for all my classes. Okay, uh, uh, adequate... <laughs> Extra credit options in a nutshell. I will send you a more detailed email as a reminder because I know it's been a month or more since I did. Uh, they are on the syllabus too, but not everybody looks there or has the time to perhaps in your busy lives. So here we go. Um, the quickest and easiest is to download either of two art related, and as I said, they've been vetted by the administration. They've read them in the academic senate which I have to answer to, believe it or not, there is such a thing. I don't vote in it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I have to run all my, you know, various procedures by them when there's any question. So uh, they've been vetted for what it's worth. Those are on Amazon Kindle. You have to input my name too, because I chose a title, South Side Story, that turns out to be a bunch of other people use that title for novels or nonfiction books about whatever subject. Mine's about growing up in Chicago in the 60s as the, based on a course, obvious real life experiences, uh, one of four sons of a uh, starving artist. My father was literally a starving artist. We starved along with him. Anyway, it's about the early 60s, very different era, and yet not really that different than what we're going, we just went through the last four years with all the controversies. Um, the civil rights movement, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, we all thought we were going to die, literally. Uh, we came pretty close to nuclear war with Russia, and going through that when you're, you know, in middle school, it's a little bit, uh, you know, of a, it leaves, I mean, a little bit more than a mild impression. So it's gotten about three, do, no, four dozen reviews. So you can see for yourself whether that interests you or not. All you have to do is download it though and show me the, the order or the last chapter as a screenshot. That's worth 15 points. The other one is a murder mystery that is an architecture based piece because I used to work uh, uh, historic buildings were something I worked with both to restore and, you know, research and then also I actually was a real estate agent. I think I told you guys that the first week, many years ago before I started teaching college. And uh, so from the early 90s, during the early Russian mafia infestation in the Bay Area, it was already happening then that far back, long before Putin. Um, and uh, it's a murder mystery, but it's got about 20 plus architecture sites, any one of which uh, you could then use as a reference for one of the other extra credit options. So that's also 15 points. That's called the Open House Murders. And the other one is South Side Story. I will put those titles, but you have to use my name by, you know, Mark Wilson, right? Then you'll get the actual link. <clears throat> okay, that's one. That's worth 15 points. You can do those too. There's 30 points. If you choose to post a review, good, bad, or in between, whatever you honestly thought, even if you only read a few chapters, there's no way to, you know, they don't limit you to how much you've read to post a review. That's another 10 points. So there, right there could be 50 points. Okay, another easy one is articles, but I've decided to limit that to four. That's reasonable. Five points for each related to art, each article that you send me, uh, which needs to be more than a paragraph, like a couple of pages uh, about art, anything relating to visual, of course, not performing arts, what we cover in this class. Doesn't have to be about ancient Egypt or medieval architecture. It could be any topic, current or or ancient art, anything in between. Uh, four such articles, five points each. That ends up being 
uh, 20 points right there. Up to that, you could do that four times. Uh, then, then we have the, uh, was the option of going to museums? Sorry, that one. So now we're down to four options. Can't do that. You may have heard they closed all the museums in the Bay Area. Just, I think, Monday, yes. Yeah. So instead of that, you can take photos of the exterior of an architectural site, but you need to give me four photos. Uh, I used to say you had to go inside. Obviously, that's not practical. So it needs to be something historic. It has an architectural interest. It, it can't be a Costco outlet or uh, you know a gas station or an In-N-Out burger uh, joint. It just should be some historic building, a church, a mosque, a synagogue, a historic home. There are plenty of them in Santa Rosa and Petaluma. And uh, those you can even find online if you don't already live in a neighborhood or know of a neighborhood where you can go. Four photos, you know, would be like a couple of exterior overviews and maybe two details. Then you do, all you have to do is send me a file with the four photos, the name of the building and your name in the class. That's 10 points. Uh, and then one more is to watch a movie. Um, yeah, the Palace of Fine Arts is excellent. Excellent. I love that place. It's been in every movie ever filmed in San Francisco, I think, or almost every movie for the last 40 years. And half the <clears throat> TV shows that uh, were set in San Francisco. Yeah, it's, it's my favorite structure in the city. And if you don't know this, Alfred Hitchcock discovered it. No, not really. He's the first filmmaker to use that site when it was crumbling into the lagoon that it now, of course, it's restored and it's in perfect condition. Uh, it was literally falling apart. It's from the 1915 San Francisco World's Fair by one of my two favorite architects, Bernard Maybeck. He was the man who invented green design. You've heard that phrase. Everyone thinks it's so current. Oh, you know, it's a 21st century, no, 1890s. He was teaching at UC Berkeley. There were no architecture professors and he was the first one hired. So he taught architecture and one of his students was the first woman American architect, a real heroine of mine, Julia Morgan, who did Hearst Castle among many other places. Uh, she was obviously his premier star student and he encouraged her to become the first woman American architect. So that's a great story. Yeah, so uh, that building, that site, excellent choice. Yeah, it's easy to get four shots there. Uh, okay, so we can do that. Thank um, you. Oh, sorry. Sure, go ahead, please, please. Um, didn't you say we could also mail pictures to you of the- um, Yes, you like, could. Oh, yes, yes, I meant is to Is it on your- Syllabus? My is not, syllabus? No, my home address, I guess I'll have to put it into an email. I'm gonna, it's going to take two emails to get all these details in, but I'll do that. Uh, okay. Maybe tomorrow or Thursday at the latest. But here we go. I'll give it to you now. I don't mind. You know, No one's going to show up at my door at uh, 7 a.m. and complain about their grade. That that happened when my daughter was six and she answered the door and she was scared. She thought, someone's here to attack you. No, no, no. They just Somebody who didn't show up for the final wanted me to give them a passing grade. Mm, can't do that. <laughs> it was after the grades were submitted. So as long as you don't show up unannounced at my door, you can mail me. Yes, it's, it's a good option. A hard copy printed out in color, please, if you want the 10 points. Otherwise, you get half credit, just like you did on the illustrations for your papers. They need to be in color. So that address, here we go. My mailing address, home address, obviously, in Berkeley is, I'll say it slowly, 927. Ensenada Avenue, I know, huh? Yeah, if you've been to Mexico, maybe you know it's named after the city there. E-N-S-E-N-A-D-A. -E -N -N Ensenada, it's phonetic, of course, Avenue. Berkeley, I think, you know, has three E's, everybody knows. Okay, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, of course, nine. 4707. And I'll put that in an email as well. Yeah, you could mail me uh, yeah, the photos there. But the final option, since we can't do the museum one, will be the fourth, is to uh, watch a one hour or longer movie, either a documentary or feature film about the life of an artist, any artist you want. There's so many great films out there. Here's one you probably never heard of, Modigliani. Oh, that, that movie will tear your heart out. He suffered a lot for his art. Uh, he had tuberculosis uh, and he was, you know, poor and he, the love of his life, unfortunately for him, the father of his intended, you know, his fiance never let them get married because he hated Jews and, you know, Modigliani was an Italian Jew living in Paris. His paintings are now selling for tens of millions of dollars. It, you'd recognize his work if you saw any uh, prints or, or images of it. Modigliani, that's what it's called. Um, 
and it's a brilliant film. But then many others you already mentioned, of course, uh, <clears throat> Frida. They often use just one name in these movies, uh, Frida Kahlo story. Or another one would be uh, <clears throat> Camille Claudel. Oh, that's a great movie with Gerard Depardieu, the funny looking French actor with a huge nose, plays um, um, Auguste Rodin, the sculptor. And she was his muse slash mistress, uh, what have you. He promised to marry her. No, nope, never did. But she had her own career and became very successful on her own after they, they broke up and parted ways. Camille Claudel, it's literally first and last name. There's so many, you can just look them up. Documentaries are okay as long as they're not little 20, 30 minute things, an hour or more. And then what do you do to prove you watched it? Write two pages, doesn't have to be sterling, brilliant text, and I won't take points off for of spelling or grammar, about what you learned about that artist's life and their work. So pick an artist that you either already like or want to know more about. There, there are so many good documentaries out there. And that's worth 10 points. So you could do that twice. You could do the um, you know, architecture thing twice. And then you could do downloading either one of my novels or, or uh, articles and make up to the total of 50 points. That's the maximum for everybody. Okay, any other questions? It's a good time to ask because we're down to the last two weeks. All right, so we covered Gothic. I hope you were, well, some of you probably weren't. Uh, if you didn't know, I post these days, actually I did it on uh, Saturday, I think around uh, noon, uh, posted. I, I tried to do it by 7 p.m. on Friday, but like I said, Friday is a family night for us. So no later than six or seven on Saturday of the week in which the lecture was, if you missed it, you can find them on YouTube. You can start by trying around 7.30 or after seven Friday. And if you don't see it, wait 24 hours, you'll see it then. Uh, they're gonna stay on there. I'm not, not taking those down. Only the ones of the tests, I already did take down the midterm obviously, and I will take down the final. Every other lecture stays up there for you to use to review or just you know, refresh your memory or, or get information for a paper. You know you can cite that as one of your new sources. One of my or any other lecture of any professor, college teacher, even high school teachers, if they, if they taught you something about art as a source for your bibliography, for your second paper, though most of you turned your second paper in by now. But if you haven't, keep that in mind. Okay, so we covered Gothic. I'm not going to recap the five main elements of Gothic because we covered it. If you, if you uh, weren't here, I hope you've seen the, the YouTube recording of it. If you didn't, you do want to see that because I put a graph up on the screen that you could, you know, uh, make note of. Uh, it will somehow, you'll need to know those features or at least some of the five features of all Gothic uh, style churches, not just cathedrals, any Gothic style church has five features, all of them in common. Uh, and we're going to see more of examples tonight. So let us now go to our first must know slide. Any other questions before we start the lecture though, about grading or your uh, any late work or extra credit? Okay, so here we go. Let's get this full screen. And there we go. Okay, this is the first must know. And uh, this is on your syllabus at the top of week 16. Just one word for the, the, the city in France where this is, this church, Reims, R-E-I-M-S. Again, R-E-I-M-S, cathedral, Reims Cathedral, France, the location. And the date is 1428. Now, Reims, I will tell you, if you go to France, can I say, I don't think anyone in there, our little mini bio said they'd been. Has anyone here been to France at all? Nope. Not, not during the last year you haven't, I'm sure this is not safe. Well, it was for a while this summer. And you know, Rick Steves, some of you PBS, right? Rick Steves, Europe, right? I noticed he started filming in Europe again for about six or eight weeks and now he's not doing it anymore. It's not safe. Yeah, so when it's safe to go, if you do go to France, don't just see Paris, as beautiful as it is. If that's all you have time for, it's well worth it. It's still the most beautiful big city, I think, uh, in the world. But there are so many other beautiful places in France and this is one of them. But if you wanna buy a ticket and you're staying in Paris, you can do it in a day and return. You know, day return, they call that, uh, in Europe where it's a round trip ticket and you go just like two hours or less by train, giving you most of the day in that city if you get an early start. And you can come home by dinner, uh, you know, to your hotel or wherever you're staying. 
back in Paris or wherever. So I, I did that with this. But uh, when I bought the ticket, this is a quick tip to the wise, uh, word to the wise. Um, you've heard the stereotype about French people being rude to Americans. It is a stereotype. And my experience is that people under 50 even now, I'd say certainly when I was there under 40, didn't seem to have that attitude. They had traveled a lot. We're talking about Gen Xers and early millennials, right? Uh, now that would extend to, of course, my daughter's generation. But I, I only occasionally met a rude shopkeeper, and there were usually people in their you know, later years, I'd just say older. And there were very few of those. I mean, you can meet rude people, of course, in any big city. Certainly you can in New York and even sometimes in, in LA, though not that much that I've heard people complain about San Francisco or Chicago. People tend to be friendlier in some places. So I wouldn't let that worry you. My point is, if you go there, figure on this. They're going to correct your mispronunciations of their language. But if they do it respectfully and politely, it's it's not an insult or, or an assault on, on us as Americans. Uh, so I tried to learn how to pronounce the name of this town in French. And guess what? They don't agree on how to pronounce the name of one of their most famous cities where this cathedral is. And we'll talk about why it's so famous in just uh, 60 seconds. So here are the three ways you can pronounce this city. I already said one, Reims. But if you're in France, they often don't say it that way. They'll say Reims or Reims. Literally, like they're clearing their throat of, uh, you know, cream cheese or something. <laughs> Literally. I heard three different ways of pronouncing the same name within the same train station trying to buy a ticket to this town. So I finally said, well, you can't fault me for not pronouncing it a certain way when you guys can't even agree. And they laughed. The people I talked to uh, uh, selling the tickets laughed at that. Most French people in a big city speak English, by the way, even if they don't like to. <laughs> so usually you'll find someone to help you with directions or, or some task like buying tickets. Okay, now, here we go. The meaning of this. First of all, it's a late Gothic cathedral, and it has a style. So now it's a specific kind of Gothic architecture. It's all part of the meaning. And I'm going to give you that. Now, you see, if you look here, the last page of your, you should always have this handout right next to you, next to the screen when we're doing our lectures, of the terms to know. Last week we covered the five features of Gothic. Now we're going to do the next term below that, flamboyant style. It's on your, your handouts, I'm not going to spell that for you, flamboyant style. So here we go, that's what this is. This is an example of a, uh, a particular kind of French style of Gothic. You might say, isn't all Gothic the same? No, you know, it was a 400 year period during which this style was popular throughout most of, well, all of Western Europe. And so of course there were variations in different countries. So here we go, here's the definition of flamboyant style. A style of late Gothic architecture in France, comma, a style of late Gothic architecture in France, comma, which uses flame-like decorations along the exterior. Again, the second half, which uses flame-like decorations along the exterior, period. The word flamboyant is French for flame-like. So let's take a closer look. That's what we're talking about. You see where the arrow is, the cursor? That's supposed to look like fire or flames licking up, because that actually happened at Notre Dame, but not on the facade, of course, inside. Um, but it, it never, it didn't happen here. Well, it sort of did. It was bombed in World War II by us, by the, well, Brits and Americans and the Air Force. Of course, they weren't trying to destroy the church. It didn't destroy the church, but it was damaged by bombs landing nearby. And I'll explain how that affects the uh, architecture in a minute. But for now, the original building, they've restored it totally uh, to its original intact condition. Had these flame-like decorations, even, let's go now towards the upper tower, on the top, this is supposed to look like, of course it's stone, so naturally they aren't gonna get too wavy like you know flames in a high-tech film would be or special effects in a movie. But they're supposed to emulate the idea of flames licking up the side of the building. Now, why in the world would they do that? So this is the next part of the meaning. The reason that this style, if I need me repeat the definition, no flamboyant? Okay. The reason that this style was so popular in France, Sorry. Can you repeat the definition? Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, 
flamboyant is a style of late Gothic architecture in France, comma, which uses flame-like decorations along the exterior. And those are visible at the top of the towers and on these points here. They're small on these, so it's hard to see, but you can see them here. It's supposed to emulate flames licking up the side of the building. Now, why would they do that? Okay, so this is the next fact about the meaning, is that this style was meant to symbolize the passionate belief in Christianity that uh, most people in France had at this time of history in the late Gothic era, or you could just say late Middle Ages. Again, the reason they used these flame-like decorations was to symbolize their passionate uh, devotion, that's a good word, or passionate belief, either one will do, in, in the uh, Christian religion, at the time of the late Middle Ages. Why? Why was it more passionate than, than say, earlier periods? Well, you don't have to be a history major to know. You've heard of the Black Death, the Bubonic Plague, the Hundred Years' War, the list goes on and on. They were living through a really tough time. Makes our COVID, you know, survival period not seem so hard by comparison, although it's tragic for those lost lives. But they literally lost one third of the population of Europe, including in France. One out of every three people died. You know, you look to the left, look to the right, and the person on one or the other side of you is not going to be there in a year because these plagues kept coming over and over in waves all over Europe. And France was one of the worst hit countries. So they had plagues. They had famine, which of course happened when people died and couldn't harvest their crops or bring them to the cities to feed the people. So they had hunger, they had famine, they had drought, <laughs> you name it, and wars. They had a war with England called the Hundred Years' War. So just keep it simple and say there was a series of calamities or tragedies that swept throughout Europe and hit France particularly hard during the late Middle Ages, including plagues, uh, famines, and wars. That's that's the short way to write that. And so they turned to religion. Because why? If you believe in the teachings, right? Those who did, back then most people in Europe did, right? Uh, accept the teachings of the Bible. That means what? This life may be lousy, rotten, don't write it that way. It may not be a very good life for most people on this earth. But when you die, if you follow the teaching of the church, you'll get to go to a good place called heaven. So many of the uh, peasants quite literally, most of them, had um, very little that they could hang on to to give them hope or, or, or any kind of sense of purpose or meaning in life. So um, if, if they were in the middle of a pandemic, right? I mean, they didn't call it that back then, a plague, right? Or wars uh, or, or starving their families. Was, they, they might have to just uh, hope that somehow they'll survive. If they pray hard enough, they'll get through this life and then they'll go to a good place. So their faith, their religious faith, was in, extremely intense and passionate. That's the reason for the symbolism of these uh, flames licking up the side or the exterior of these buildings, the flamboyant style. Now, this also, if this were on the exam, I'm not saying whether I will or won't cut it from the study list at this point, but uh, these three doors, these, I already covered this last week, but some of you weren't here and maybe you all, uh, some people joined late. Uh, three doors is typical of all Catholic, specifically now this is Catholic uh, cathedrals. So of course, this is when all of Europe was Catholic or Western Europe anyway. So, so these three doors symbolize the three holiest figures, uh, just to recap if, if you didn't get that last week. And they are in the Catholic religion or church, I should say. It's not a religion. Christianity is a religion. The Catholics are a subgroup, right? Everybody understands that distinction. So within the Catholic Church, the three holiest figures are God, Jesus, supposedly the Father is God and his Son is Jesus, and the third would be the Holy Spirit. Don't ask me to explain that. It's a ghost that God can send down, or spirit, down to earth for me messages to the human race. So God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are symbolized by the three doors. And then we have the features that mark it as Gothic. Remember the rose window, isn't that a beautiful one? That's a big one too. It's not as big as the ones at Notre Dame, but it's about 32 feet, big enough. I've been inside this church, it's beautiful inside. And then we have the pointed arches on the doors 
and the windows. You see them all the way up. And now the flying buttresses aren't visible here, but there's the edge of some of them. We saw them last week at Notre Dame with my own slides. I showed you how, showed you how it would be to walk around the outside of Notre Dame. And you'll see them again tonight with the last few minutes of slides of my own where you don't need to take notes, what the flying buttresses look like from above. And I'll answer the question, is it true, as in the movie versions of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, that someone could use those mouths, the open mouths of the gargoyles, to spew hot burning liquid down below? I'll answer that question. Uh, when we get to those slides at the end of the night. Okay, so the rose window is another gothic feature. The pointed arches, the flying buttresses, you can't see, but they're there. And then inside is a gothic groin vaulting. Okay, so now let's uh, back, back up and say one more thing about the meaning. The city of Reims used to be the um, capital of France before Paris. So it's where the kings had their thrones and where they were, um, you know, uh, right, um, what's invested is the word they used to use, right? Where they were crowned. The king, just say it that way. The kings of France were crowned in this city and in this cathedral for many, many decades or generations even before Paris became the capital. And I don't know the exact year that happened, but it was sometime after 1500. So, so uh, Reims was the capital of the kingdom of France and it's where the kings presided over their kingdom and were crowned inside this church. And then last but not least, here's my favorite fact about the meaning of this slide. And I think it'll be some of your easiest for some of you to remember. This is the birthplace of Champagne. The city of Reims is where the first Champagne was discovered. It was an accident, by the way. Under the streets. Now that should get your uh, curiosity, huh? What? Wine flowing in the sewers or something? No, no, no. The, the caves, you know some of you should know about. You've been to any of the wineries here in California that claim they make champagne. Don't tell that to a French person. They get angry. Nobody can make champagne except this region of France because that's they believe they have a patent on it. In any case, the original champagne was first created here in the caves, uh, which were, of course, you know, maintained by vintners, people making wine, uh, under the streets of Reims. And it's still one of the main centers for uh, producing champagne in, in all of France. The birthplace, in other words, of champagne is the city of Reims and the champagne or wine caves where they were made, the first bottles were under the streets here. Literally, they run under the cathedral. You can take a tour of them now and really good champagne they make in France. Anyway, so that's the last fact about the meaning on this slide. Okay, formal analysis. You can see it's symmetrical. Now, I didn't take this slide. My slides were, were done when there was no scaffolding, but uh, they are digitalized. So just imagine that's gone. Obviously, it's completely symmetrical. Twin towers, you notice the Gothic, French style of Gothic, they seem to like these identical towers, which we know the one at Notre Dame, the one on the left is two feet or about two to three feet wider. But other than that, they are identical. Well, these are totally, completely identical. Same height, same width. These are about 260 feet high. No, it's I got 240, sorry. So for space, there we go, let me rephrase. The space here is the real space of these twin towers that reach a height of about 240 feet. It's a little bit taller than the ones at Notre Dame. And then we have the nave. The nave has a fairly high ceiling. It's about 130 feet, not quite as, as, as tall as the nave. It doesn't go up to here. That's not the actual roof line. The roof line is right here. It's about 130 feet tall. It's a pretty tall nave, but there are taller ones in, in, in France. And then we have, that's the real dimension. That's all you remember for building. It's, there's no technique for space. It's the actual dimensions that you mention, should mention. All right, then we have the, the uh, rhythm, of course, of the pointed arches. Uh, the flamboyant or ca uh, carved flame-like decorations there, there, and there. Lots of repeated shapes here, of course. The doors, right, the windows. Uh, and then we have their dynamic, the pointed arches, of course, the rose window uh, and, and the uh, doorways, right? The cur uh, pointed I mean, arch doorways. But the actual towers and the corners or the edges of the walls are stable. So of course it's, it's both stable and dynamic. The modeling obviously here is a shadow, uh, shadows created by the sun. There is carved line, but it's hard to see. If this is on the exam, this is the view you'll have. So you could just say in this view, uh, there's only visual line along the edges of the arches, the corners of the towers and the, the walls. 
Okay, and then we have the largest mass, that'd be the towers, pretty clearly. Uh, and then I would say the central or center section of the facade. And then the doors, well, the middle door would be the largest. Doorway, I should say, doorway, not doors. This whole arch here would be the third largest mass. Okay, and the uh, color is a cool gray or off kind of light gray, actually, light gray stone. It's a bit dirty. You may be able to tell there's a lot of soot and pollution in this city. It's a very industrial city. Um, <clears throat> so they don't have any, uh, you know, they're cleaning it, I think, with the scaffolding. So, so it, the actual color is, we'll go up closer. Here we go. Is that kind of, oh, you could even say off-white, but, you know, gray and or off-white. It's kind of a combination. There is no warm color here except in the stained glass which by the way you could add this you don't have to there's one more fact about the meaning they those windows were destroyed by the by the fighting in world war ii i think it was both bombing american bombing raids nearby we didn't try to destroy this cathedral well, france was an ally of ours but the nazis were all over so it got damaged both from bombing and from fighting in the streets when the american soldiers uh, you know, liberated, literally liberated the city from the Nazis. So those windows almost all shot out. I think one survived. The rose windows and the other stained glass, because you know they're not the only stained glass windows. There are others in the back of the church. So they had to be- It was World War One or World War Two. II? World War Two. good question. World War One. This this building was slightly damaged, but we didn't have the big bombs, you know, the kind that World War Two had. So uh -huh. not too much damage. There was a few pieces of glass that were uh, broken in World War I. So I'm talking about World War II. And so what happened, the last fact about the meaning, you don't have to write it, but it's kind of an interesting thing, that they were replaced and the design for the stained glass windows was Marc Chagall. Uh, if you haven't heard him, you should, you should. He's one of the top artists of the 20th century. If you take our 2.3 or 2.2, I think they come up through 20th century painting, don't they? Or 1.2. Well, 1.2 doesn't, but I, I'm going to teach uh, the class where we cover 20th century painting. Marc Chagall was a, a French Jewish painter. He left wisely before the Nazis took over and then came back after the war. Uh, he lived the rest of his life. He lived to be 101 years old. And I met his main assistant when I was in Paris, who had helped him design and install these modern style windows. They're not medieval looking. They're not, the original glass is just gone. So he just designed the so very 50s vintage, the kind of art where he did was kind of expressionist, which doesn't mean anything to most of you, but some of you might know. It's not super realistic, nor is it abstract. It's in between. So he did different images. Now he was Jewish. This is a Catholic cathedral. It didn't matter. He did synagogues, mosques, and churches, stained glass windows on every continent. But he was most famous for his paintings. And his paintings are selling in the tens of millions now. There are whole exhibits of his work in major museums around the world, where well, there were until the pandemic, at least. Uh, there was one in San Francisco. The lines were out, out the door and down past the, two blocks past the, the entrance. A very popular artist, Mark, M-A-R-C, Chagall, C-H-A-G-A-L. Uh, but you don't have to, you know, spell his name correctly if you want to mention that. He did the redesigned windows after World War II to replace the, the destroyed ones from the war, the ones that were destroyed. All right, let's wrap it up here with, um, let's see, what we, oh, texture. It's a real smooth texture of glass, real rough texture of stone and wood, of course, on the doors. Um, and then uh, balanced, yeah, it's balanced. Being symmetrical definitely is. Okay, did I forget anything? I don't think so. Yeah, color and texture. All right, let's move on to the next must know. Here's sort of what I was talking about last week, the next must know. Um, oh, did I take it off? I did, I took it off the study list. You guys get a break, okay. Um, these are Gothic sculptures outside the entranceways. You don't have to write this now, just, just follow me here for a few minutes. We'll keep this brief, <coughs> uh, maybe three or four minutes. These are, uh, saints and prophets from the Bible. Well, actually one is just an angel. So there's just a, a generic angel. You know, angels aren't male or female according to the Bible, right? So that's an angel, you know. Uh, and then we have clearly in this case, three female uh, holy figures from the Bible, prophets probably, uh, or, or uh, early saints. And they're outside the doors to uh, Chartres Cathedral. We covered Chartres. That's the second oldest Gothic church in the world. 
uh, in this city by the same name. We covered it last week. It's on the syllabus. So if you, if you definitely want to study that one, uh, make sure you study it carefully for the final. Has a high possibility of being on the exam. <clears throat> but I showed you, uh, you know, those views. Now here, these figures have more liveliness to them than the ones at, uh, uh, you know, the other uh, ones I showed you at, at Chart. And there's no way to know for sure why that's true. All we can say is that the artist here decided to put a little bit more emotion and lightness. But even so, they're not in movement, like moving emotion, or sorry, I meant to say in motion or, or visibly like posed in, in, in uh, moving positions, like the Romanesque sculpture we saw a couple of weeks ago. That style, all the main figures were always uh, lively, full of energy. And Hello? Yes. Hello? Sorry, somebody turned. Hello? Oh. Uh-oh. Now, okay. can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. Oh, good. Yeah, let me, yeah, this says the internet connection is unstable. Let's wait a second until that goes off the screen. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? I hope. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. So let's move on from this. I just wanted you to see that just like in every period of art, everyone who's ever created art or studied it before you took this class knows this. But if you didn't, it's something to keep in mind if you keep an interest in art after you finish this class. Any period you study or style or movement of art, there's going to be variations where some of those artists are either ahead of their time, of course, or, or they just do something different than most other artists in that style or that period. We're choosing to do. These are not quite as stiff and ramrod upright as the ones we saw last week outside of uh, the, and actually I misspoke, you guys can, it doesn't matter, it's not on the syllabus and it's not a must know. These are outside of Strasbourg Cathedral, which is a different city in France, not Chartres, that's why they look different. Uh, the ones at Chartres we saw last week, remember they were stiff and ramrod and they, they barely had any life to them and no emotion in their faces, at least here you see some emotion. So this is later Gothic architecture in the flamboyant style and these, these statues were carved in that same period. So whoever the artist in this cathedral in a different part of France chose for whatever reason, whoever it was, he, he or she, probably a man, would have chosen to, uh, for some reason, to show more life, more, more emotion in, in the poses, a little bit, not a lot, but more than the uh, most Gothic sculpture. And definitely in the, at least some of the expressions, like this angel looks happy, right? <clears throat> and this one looks sad. And it's not an angel, of course, that would be a female holy figure, uh, holy woman from the Bible. Okay, now we go to the next must know. I have fun with this. I love trashing this. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> There's some things wrong with this, <laughs> and I'll explain them. But first, we'll give you the main facts, and then I'll give you my take on them. It's the next must-know, so you do need to write this. Dormition, that's D-O, it's a long title. I'll spell it twice for you. Uh, the, the title is Dormition. That means the, you know, death and rising to heaven uh, of, of, of virgin, that's Mary, of course, at Strasbourg Cathedral. I'll spell those words. Dormition is D-O-R-M-I-T-I-O-N. Dormition of the Virgin, or we know how to spell that, at Strasbourg is S-T-R-A-S-B-O-U-R-G. Again, S-T-R-A-S-B-O-U-R-G, Strasbourg. And it's a cathedral. And the location is a country, of course, France. I just mentioned this, this city, and the last slide was a different part of the facade of the same cathedral, France, and the date is 1230. So now this is not flamboyant. There's no flame-like ornaments here. These are just regular Gothic arches below a scene. So what we need to focus on is what's the scene depicting? What event from the Bible? Maybe the death of Mary? Or yes, somewhere? exactly. Yeah. Exactly, that's her there. Mary, the mother, when they say the virgin, they mean, you know, that miracle again, if you know, if you have Catholic heritage or otherwise no people do, you probably know this, so you don't have to understand it. Supposedly she uh, never had sex and she just gave birth through a virgin miracle. She remained a virgin even after giving birth to Jesus. So that's why she's called the Virgin Mary. That's her right there lying down, literally exactly on her deathbed. And this is the other Mary, the only female disciple of Jesus. Uh, you don't have to know her name for this uh, course, but for those who do want to know, some of you already know, it's Mary Magdalene. 
And maybe a few of you know the novel, The uh, Da Vinci Code, actually it's a pretty good book, although it's got a lot of false statements in it about the early days of the Catholic Church because the author, Dan Brown, uh, obviously had a grudge against the Catholic priest that used to teach him. He, he admitted that when he was interviewed. That book sold 25 million copies, right? Uh, so anyway, that book, Da Vinci Code, mentions that she, some people think, might have been the secretly the wife of Jesus. There's no real evidence for that, but that's a theory. Anyway, just say she's the only female disciple, also named Mary, and she is, you know, mourning the passing of the Virgin Mary. There are all the other disciples are gathered around her deathbed. And then Jesus has come down from heaven. That's him, according to the you know, way he was depicted at that time in medieval Europe. So there he is in the middle, saying his blessings like, you're going to be with me, mother, in heaven soon, you know, when, when you, the spirit goes up to heaven. But I think this is one of the odd things about there's several. He's holding a statue of himself as a baby. That seems a little strange to me. I, I don't know. Yes. I mean, did he have it with him in heaven? He brought it back down to earth. Or was he handed it when he shows up as a spirit here? And if he's a ghost, you how, off. how could he hold it on his uh, hands if he's a ghost? Sorry, please go ahead. Any comments? You cut off for a while. I know. So I'm going to go back. Yeah, that, that, that happened twice now, huh? So what was the last thing you guys heard? Was, was it where this is, the title? Oh. I'm confused. Supp supposed to be Virgin Mary, or this is yes, this is Mary the Virgin Magdalena. Mary. There she, oh, okay. is. that's her okay. lying on her deathbed. So you okay. now then you could hear me because you obviously answered my question. Yeah. So I'll just repeat everything since then. And this I maybe didn't hear. The other female kneeling at her bedside is Mary Magdalene. Don't ask me to spell it. She's the only female disciple, and according to some people, including that novel. You don't have to write that, the Da Vinci Code. Just say some people believe that she might have secretly been married to Jesus. Now I'll repeat what I said about him. <laughs> In this image, he's come down from heaven to what? Help guide his mother's soul or spirit when she dies back up to heaven to be with him, right? That's, that's in the Bible. That's, but what is odd is that he's carrying a miniature sta a statue. Well, not miniature, just a, yeah, well, it is. It's not full size. So it's a small or miniature statue of himself. Why would he be doing that? And, and if he's a spirit, he can't hold on to a solid piece of wood or stone like that, right? <laughs> it would go right through his hands. Uh, that, nobody explains that. I've never seen an explanation of why this is the only image I ever have seen on any Gothic church or medieval church in Europe. Where Jesus comes down from heaven, yes, that's a common theme, to see his disciples, and that's the other people, all, all these other men around him, and then one female disciple, there she is, Mary. So that isn't unusual, but having him holding a statue of himself while he's standing there in a spirit form, I don't know what the reason for that is. But my favorite feature, I hope you can all hear me now, you guys can? Go. Yes, yes, we can hear good. you. Yeah. Is this... What is going on here? Anybody here read the play Hamlet or seen the film version of it? You yeah, that's poor Yorick, you know, where the guy picks up the skull of a dead friend of his out of his the friend's grave and holds the skull up and talks to it. This is supposed to be another person, but it looks like a detached head being held in this man's hand. It's, it doesn't, it's just poorly done. The bottom line you should write, whether you write those slightly satirical comments, you can ignore them if you want, is that this is typical of how many late medieval sculptors, as in the person, sculptors with an O-R-S, Many medieval sculptors had lost the ability to depict realistic depth in space. If you recall back about five weeks ago or so, right after the midterm, I said that was what happened even by late Roman times. Well, they're still having that issue. This is not at all realistic. There is no foreshortening, diminishing size, right? Or any realistic depiction of depth here. Now we're going to do the form analysis now. Because most medieval sculptors didn't know how to do that. It wasn't until the Renaissance, it, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the, all the great Renaissance sculptors began learning, or the right way is to say that, is relearning the skills of the ancient classical artists in creating realistic depth and, and proportions. I mean, there should be, you know, these people are supposed to be behind these people, and then this guy, he's in front of them, and then they should, 
there's no difference in any, you know, no diminishing size, no, no realistic depiction of depth or space at all. The only technique, let's now do the formal analysis that's used in this sculpture for space, of course, is overlapping, obviously. The figures overlap each other. It is realistically, uh, or let's say, uh, yeah, lifelike, or you could say, or realistic in the detailing. So well done uh, with carved line, semi-ad texture. That's well done. That they hadn't lost the skills. You see it on the hair, right, of all these figures. They all seem to have this. They all look alike, too. Do you notice that? They all have the same hairdo and beard, every one of them. Might as well be the same guy posing. You see, look at their faces and their expressions. They can't all have looked that much alike, all 12 disciples. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's comical to me. I, yeah, I, I didn't even notice that, but they look alike, you know. Yeah, the, it's the like, male faces. where did these guys come from? Yeah, anyway, according to the Bible, they did describe some of the disciples. Some of them were, you know, like Peter was really an old man, and then there was two or three really young ones in their 20s. Yeah, it just doesn't fit. Anyway, that's the way this artist depicted it, because it was easier for him, because he didn't have the skill. Uh, to do more realistic images, let alone depictions of depth. So let's finish with the formal analysis and then we'll go on to the next slide. This is only overlapping. There's only taking for space. There is really good simulated texture on the car and it's with car line, of course, on the hair and the clothing mostly, right? And you could even say the bed sheet here. The largest mass, well, that's a close call, but I'd say it's Mary. If you, if you look at her from head to toe, she seems pretty large, larger than the men standing behind her which, uh, you know, could have been the case. There we go, there's a full view. And then the next largest mass, that's a close call. Maybe it's Mary Magdalene or these two male disciples. Again, they look just alike on either side, except he's a little more balding than that one. Um, I, I think it's first, and then Jesus, you can only see the upper half of his body, so he'd be, what, fourth, I guess. So it, I'd say it's the two Marys, first Virgin Mary, then Mary Magdalene, then these two. But then, you know, maybe you see them as larger than her. They're, they're bent over. So if you want to say they, if they stood up, they'd be the second largest masses, then Mary Magdalene, and then Jesus. Okay, there's modeling. Of course, it's, it's a bas relief or high relief figure. These figures are, I mean, piece of sculpture or panel of sculpture. Now a lot. Yeah, so there's a lot of modeling, and that's the shadows, the deep shadows created by the sun. They're part, of, in this case, part of the design. Without those, you couldn't see them. It's dynamic, mm, yeah, sort of. I mean, these heads are all off at odd angles, right? Is that they're floating in the space behind the, for the people in the front. Uh, so you could just say that um, it, it's a mixture of dynamic to some angle, some degree, there are angles on the heads of the, the, the tilt of the heads. But Mary is lying straight, right? Uh, and Jesus is standing upright, as is the statue he's holding of himself. So it's a mixture of stable and dynamic. And is it balanced? Yes. There's an even number of disciples on either side, Jesus in the middle, as is Mary. So it is balanced, right? And the rhythm is obvious with the um, repeated uh, shapes of the bodies, arms, hands, heads, uh, and, and the clothing, of course. And then the color is actually a warm pinkish color of stone. That's actually the real color. It's an unusual, and you can see it here too in the arch. Okay, plenty on this one now. This slide is an important one for tonight. Oh. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Did you say something about um, uh, space? Or? Yeah, I said there was only overlapping. Overla Oh, okay. Yeah, no other technique. No foreshortening, no diminishing size, just overlapping on the last slide. Okay, the okay. next two, I'm going to cut one of them because they're similar, but I'm not going to tell you which one now. We'll do that two weeks from tonight. Or sorry, next week. I'm sorry, next week when we review for the final, which is two weeks from tonight. So for now, assume either this or the next cathedral could be on the study list. Uh, for but I will cut one of them because I understand a lot of people see Gothic cathedrals as looking all alike or nearly alike. Yeah. Uh, but for now, take extra thorough notes because one of these two will has a I won't say for sure, but it has a high possibility of being on the final, whether it's in the slide identification or slide essay part. Okay, this is a pretty interesting slide if you uh, follow the history of it. Cologne Cathedral just two words. Cologne is a city in Germany, as many of you know, and it's also a men's perfume, right? Cologne, C-O-L-O-G-N-E. Again, C-O, 
C-O-L-O-G-N-E, Cologne Cathedral, Germany, 1248. Or as my aunt in Indiana likes to pronounce the town, she knows about the men's, her husband used Cologne, right? My uncle, of course. Uh, but she would say, oh, that's that wonderful cathedral in Cologne, Cologne, Germany. Okay, if that helps you to, to spell it, yeah, it's, of course, you can look it up since you all have the open book method of taking your exams. Anyway, so uh, Cologne, of course, is the pronunciation. So why is this a, uh, the, the one cathedral we're seeing in all of Germany, which is by, by far the most populous, you'll have to know this, but it is the most populous country in Europe. There's 82 million people in Germany and none of the other countries have more than about 65 million. France and uh, Italy and England all around that. But uh, Germany is, even after it lost a lot of territory at the end of World War II to its neighbors, you may know if you know your history from the 20th century, it's still the largest populations and many, many big cities. Germany is full of a lot of big cities with cathedrals. Why are we picking this one? Here we go. Now you start writing the meaning. Because there are several reasons. First of all, this was the tallest cathedral these two towers were the tallest cathedral towers ever designed in Germany, but they weren't finished until the 1800s. Now I'll say why in a few minutes, but the bishop who designed them left a blueprint and they were going to be finished. And then they had, they had these plagues, right? And droughts and famines and wars. Uh, Germany wasn't even a country in the Middle Ages. It was a bunch of little warring kingdoms. So, so because of chaos and death and, and plagues, they never finished the tower. So what did the church look like when it opened? The towers were not finished. So this was the base right here. And everything where my arrow's pointing from there above that to the top was not finished until 1870. It's not that it took them that long. It's that they stopped working on it in 12, you don't have to know this too much detail, but in 1248, well, that's uh, actually on the uh, syllabus. So that year you do need to know, right? Or, or at least round it off to the decade. Remember, you can pick just the decade, 20, uh, 1240. Anyway, in 1248, when the church was opened, it was not totally finished in that the towers were left un, undone, literally. I mean, just open space. So when they resume building the towers, that's another part of the meaning now. This is the second, maybe most important fact about this church and why we picked it as the only one we're gonna show you of a German Gothic church. Uh, besides having designed it originally to have the two tallest towers in Germany and then not finishing them until the mid 18 or late 1800s, 1870, um, <clears throat> The reason that the towers finally were finished in the 1800s, you don't have to know the exact year, but it was 1870, is because of Bismarck. And if you don't know who he was, then you need to write this. He's considered the father of modern Germany. He's the guy who, in essence, was the power behind the, you know, the Kaiser. The Kaiser was their king, right? They had a king. Call himself a Kaiser, just like the Russians say the word Tsar and the Romans said the word Caesar. They all mean the same thing in different languages. So they had a king, but he didn't have the real power in the 1800s. He didn't. That was a man named Bismarck. So he was the power behind the throne and he wanted to unify Germany. That's not a minor detail. This building became the project by which Bismarck, and it's pretty much just like it sounds, uh, Bismarck, B-I-S-M-A-R-K, but you don't have to worry about the spelling, just write it like it sounds. Bismarck, the man who uh, is considered the father of modern Germany, helped unify Germany for the first time by making a national project out of finishing the towers of this cathedral. So you can see how important it is in the history of Germany. He decided to have a fundraising thing, you know, and a propaganda campaign and whatever, all it took, you know, advertising. Of course, back then it was all in print, right? Uh, to, to get people all over Germany from little school kids, kindergarten kids, all the way up to retired, you know, veterans and things, you know, church, of course, other church officials, not just the ones in Cologne, in all the other uh, cities throughout Germany that had churches, they all raised money, millions and millions of dollars to finish the towers of Cologne Cathedral as a joint project so that by the time those uh, cathedral towers were finished in 1870, he had convinced those kingdoms to all become one country, the modern country of Germany. So that's a pretty important event in the history of the world, right? Since Germany went on to then... <laughs> 
I have many German friends. Ich spreche eine wenig Deutsch, so I'm not dissing Germany, but hey, you know, they did start three wars. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. They, they sort of are considered responsible. First, they attacked France in 1870, right? They saw the Franco-Prussian War, then World War I, then World War II. And now they become one of the most peaceful countries they really are in, 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 in the entire continent of Europe. They haven't had any problems with their neighbors since then. So all I'll say is that that was a kind of a symbolic uh, project that their first, you know, kind of political leader, even if he wasn't the official leader, he really was, Bismarck, his name was, uh, conceived or came up with, created, that's better word, created this project. And it, it worked beautifully. It was a propaganda you know, PR campaign to get people to stop thinking of themselves as separate little kingdoms and instead become a new nation called Germany. Okay, so that's a fact. And then there's the last fact that might be the most, to me, the most easy to remember and interesting and unique about this church. What is the reason it's still standing? World War II, if you see, ever see a photograph of any German cities that were bombed like Cologne was because it was a big factory town with all kinds of, you know, everything, bridges and railroad yards and, you know, factories. And so we bombed the, I could use a word I can't say online here, the daylights out of this city. It was nothing but knee-high rubble. Look around here. Can you see in this photo? There are no historic buildings. It's a medieval city. They were bombed into rubble, except the cathedral. That's not an accident. It's not a reconstruction. It's not a restoration. That's the original church standing on the original site. How did it survive? Let me give you guys a clue and see if anyone can guess. There was a certain reason why the American and British bombers chose not to bomb this church in the middle of a city where they bombed everything around it. Can anybody guess why the Americans and British, you could just say the Allies, that's what we called ourselves in World War II, the, you know, the people that fought Germany. The Allies or the Brits and the Americans chose not to bomb this church for one practical reason. Anybody guess what that was? Maybe because it was a church or because it was, I don't know, something that's symbolic? Guess. No. That's a good guess. And art, symbolic art or architecture? Well, that would be the nice version of why we, we didn't bomb it. But actually that wasn't the reason. In other cities, I mean, it's, it's a good educated guess because in other parts of the world, like in Italy, when the Italians were occupied by the Nazis and we had to bomb some of their cities, we avoided destroying all those Roman, they were already ruins, but I mean, you know, bombing them into rubble. Uh, but because Italy, you know, was, was a country we wanted to ally with after the war. With Germany, or we actually were, <clears throat> the, the Italians didn't want the Nazis there. And so we had to liberate the country of Italy. So we didn't bomb their churches and their monuments. We bombed the uh, the word I'm thinking of, it begins with an S, out of every city in Germany, including Berlin, <coughs> dozens of churches were bombed. Not every church, but many, many. No, there's a, a, a military practical reason. Anybody want to take another guess? Uh, it's an obvious landmark. Yes, for the bombers. Yeah, I think you got it. Excellent. Yeah. That was. Yes, so here's how you guys can write it. This uh, church survived World War II and was deliberately... Uh, kept intact or not bombed, you could say it that way, <clears throat> by the Allies, that's with a capital A, doesn't matter how you spell it, uh, by the Allied bombers, because it was a perfect landmark for the bombers to use because they knew where they were. You can see, another way to write it, and this is a fact, I know I've flown into, into the Germany over this church. You can see the towers of this church from 75 miles away. On a clear, it's all flat there. There are no mountains in this part of Germany. So if you're flying over France, right, heading into Germany to bomb it near the end of World War II, you just look for these two towers. Okay, there's Cologne, head right, head left, go keep going. So it was used, I'll summarize it in a sense. This church or the towers, which is the church itself, and of course because of the towers being so tall. So just say this church was used as a strategic bombing site, sighting, sorry, sighting device to help orient the bombers or direct, you can say it that way, American and British bombers. So they knew where they were. It was only a military reason why they didn't bomb it into rubble. Everything around it, look at this, all of that. 
was once medieval wood frame houses, you know, and, and stone, uh, you know, apartment buildings and, and so forth. The bishop's house, it's gone. It would have been right here, it would have been stone, it would have been as old as the church, long gone. But we somehow managed to, it's called precision bombing, bomb everything around it and keep the church because the towers were useful for our air force to use as sighting devices. So that's the only reason it's still standing. Um, okay, plenty on the meaning here. Oh, oh no, there is one more fact. And this might be the easiest to, to, to remember and the shortest to write. This is the largest Gothic style building in the world. The largest. It has the second tallest nave and the towers are the third tallest in the world. As I said, when they were designed, originally intended to be built in the Middle Ages, if they had been completed back then, they would have been the tallest. So two even taller towers are in other parts of Germany. So just say it this way to keep it simple. It's the largest in terms of volume, you know, total space. The largest Gothic style building of any kind, church or otherwise, in the world, and the third tallest church towers in the world. 515 feet, these towers here. I've climbed up here, you can, there's a staircase and you can go all the way up here and boy, is it scary to get up there because your face is sticking right out those little openings. Let's see if I can get, yeah, uh, there, there's openings you can, actually, I think it ends right about here. Yeah, yeah, that's about as high as you can go, but that's a good 450, 480 feet above the uh, sidewalk. So anyway, they are 515 feet tall. So let's start formal analysis with space. The two towers, they're identical in height. So they are both, uh, 515 feet. That's including this little finial, right? Uh, the actual tower ends here, and that would be 505. You could just say slightly over 500 feet and keep it simple. The nave is 168 feet tall. You could say nearly 170 feet tall. That's an amazingly tall ceiling. There it is, the nave, right? Uh, and then let's back up now. The color isn't obvious from this slide, but it is a cool gray stone. Maybe it is sort of Depends on how your computer screen projects this. Mine, it sometimes looks a little yellowish. It's not. The stone is definitely a cool gray color. This is very industrial. Boy, Cologne is probably the most, well, one of the most industrial big cities in all of Germany. So there's pollution and soot on the outside of it. Every I've been there four times, passed through sometimes just quickly by train and looked out the window. And twice I actually stayed in Cologne. And every time I go, it's dirty. So the original color, is a, a cool gray, just put it that way. And then we have the simulated, uh, sorry, not simulated, I meant real texture of rough stone and smooth glass. That's all you can see here. By the way, there's a rose window. It's a very small one, but it's there. Uh, and there, that creates rhythm, of course, the pointed arches all the way up into the towers, right? Uh, and then we have the flying buttresses. Here they are. They're just projecting here at the back end. You, you barely see them. But if you stood next to them, you'd see they're the tallest flying buttresses also in the world. Because well, they almost reach, well, no, not the height of the ceiling here, but they reach well over 150 feet, the flying buttresses. You don't have to know that. Just the height of the nave is about 170 feet or nearly, nearly 170 feet. Okay, so we have the rhythm of the flying buttresses the uh, pointed arch doors and windows, the two tape, tall tapering spires, there they are. Uh, and of course it's dynamic on all those features, uh, stable on the corners of the walls, right? Uh, right, and the edges of the towers. And there is carved line, of course, obviously, because there's decoration, though you can't see up close here in this slide, you just say there's lots of carved line all over the facade or exterior. Uh, and then there's the visual line at the corners, which of course is created by the modeling, the shadows from the sun. Uh, and then we have, let's see, it's balanced. Oh yeah, totally, completely symmetrical. Uh, but that's left to right. It's obviously unbalanced toward the bottom as are almost all Gothic cathedrals. Uh, the largest mass, it's the towers. That should be obvious. If it's not, it, it is the two towers. Then the nave. And then here's a good word. Uh, you don't have to use it to get an A on the exam, but it, it's a good word to use. That's the crossing, but that's not really the right word. That's confusing uh, for people who know architecture. So the right word is transept with an EPT. If you want to say crossing, I, I would allow you to use that on the exam, but that's the third largest mass. Okay, uh, and then let's see, rhythm, I already mentioned that, dynamic, yeah. stable, I think I covered everything, color and space, right? Yeah, I did. 
Okay. Well, what do you say about the second liar's mask? Oh, that would be the nave. See, you could just see the edge of it here. Let's go. That, that's the back end of the church, and it runs like this up to there. That's it. See that? That's, How do you that's spell the that? second largest nav. N-A-V-E. Remember, that word is a word you will need to know. It will come up on the final. I'm N-A-V-E. Looking on the seal. I can't find out the name. It's on it's on your uh terms to know. Yeah, if you it's at the I top know. of the same page. You see above the five main features of Gothic churches. N A V E. Um, the long see. central aisle of a Christian church. Okay. Right. That's it. That's it. You see how it goes? I'm I'm showing you with, with the Yeah. Yeah. It's you can see how long it is. It's longer than the crossing or arms of the church. And that's called a transept, if you want to write the right word. That would be the third largest mass. And then you don't have to get more than the top three. That's enough. Okay. Oh, I got it. Maybe. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Yeah. Here. Definitely on. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, and, okay. And also, it's in my lecture when you go, you know, if you go back to uh, two weeks ago, we, I defined it. Oh, it's, yeah. It's on YouTube, of course. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this one. Yep. Right, I covered all the elements. Yeah. All right, that's not part of it. Now, this is interesting. It's turned black and white, and I bought this slide. I guess it's lost all the color once it got transposed into a digital. Well, that's all right. This is another one, that, one of the two that could be from tonight, a high possibility, but I'm not gonna say for sure if, if not both, but one or the other will be cut from the study list when we review next week. And for now, take thorough notes. This is Salisbury Cathedral. Salisbury is just like the steak, right? It's spelled the same, a city in England. S-A-L-I-S-B-U-R-Y. Salisbury Cathedral, of course, England, 1330. This is the decorated style. Now that's, we have two de more definitions tonight, this one and one more. And we're gonna still finish early, I promise you. But this is a definition you need to write now. This is an example of a style of English Gothic architecture called the decorated style. So here's that definition. A decorated style is a style of late Gothic architecture in England, a comma, a style of late Gothic architecture in England, comma, in which the exterior was decorated with carved stone ornaments. In which the exterior was decorated with carved stone ornament. I don't mean hanging from the building, but let's go up close and you'll see, everybody got that? Here, to see that? Look all the way up the tower, even on the tower spire. Oh, so, so carved, Stone Still. decorations are on the outside. That's why it's called decorated Gothic. It's a late Gothic style in England. It parallels the period of the flamboyant in France. Remember what I said a couple times this semester? It's an easy uh, sort of um, maxim, right? Truth, uh, fact of history in art, especially. The later any work of art is, not just architecture, but especially with architecture, uh, later a work of, uh, of a structure, in this case, let's say a building is, in a certain style, the more ornate it will be. Well, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that the French got more ornate with their flamboyant style in the late Gothic period than they were in the early Gothic period. And here we are in England, where that's true with this style, the English decorated. We just call it decorated because it means it's from England. Okay, but this this building is amazing. There's so many facts about I'll keep to just four or five, the most important ones for the meaning. Let's start with the fact that it has, Salisbury Cathedral has the tallest church tower in the British Isles. And if you don't know what that means, <laughs> take a look at a map, of course, if you get a chance, but I'll just mention it. That's the main island, which is England, Scotland, and Wales. And by the way, Scotland's thinking of, of seceding. I don't think that's smart. I'm Scottish. I have Scottish heritage anyway. I think they should stay with Great Britain. I, uh, anyway, whatever. We'll find out. They're going to take a vote next year about whether to secede from England. Uh, they didn't want to join Brexit, and they don't like the way the government of England is handling the uh, COVID crisis. So who knows? It may be the first time in 400 years that Scotland has become independent. So I'll say it again. The church spire is the tallest church tower uh, or spire. Or you can say it either way. In all of the British Isles, which includes England, Scotland, Wales, with a W, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So don't have to write those things. That's too much detail. Just say in the British Isles. 
there are two islands, Ireland and Britain proper, right? The two islands side by side of the British Isles. So just say the British Isles. So again, the tallest church tower in the uh, British Isles, it's 405 feet tall. Now let's go up close. And I'll tell you another fact that to me, in some ways, the most interesting fact, it had the first airplane warning light in Europe. Maybe not the world, but in Europe. It, around 1920, you don't have to know that year, but just say in the early 1900s, the government of Britain put a red flashing light. That's what it is. It flashes every five seconds, 24 hours a day. It, for 100, actually, it's 100 years old now. That is an early example of, uh, of some trying to warn airplanes because 1920, there weren't a lot of planes flying around, but there were some. Of course, you know, after World War I, they were beginning to be commercial flights. So they anticipated the air traffic that now, of course, is very, very prominent throughout the skies of Great Britain, of course. So once again, I'll, I'll state that in a single sense. This has the first airplane at the top of the spire. The government installed the first airplane warning light uh, in Europe, a, a circa 1920. It might have been a little earlier. And no plane has ever crashed into this tower. You might think, well, well, who would? Well, hey, you know how foggy it gets? It's not just in werewolf movies. <laughs> it's true. It really gets foggy in the British uh, countryside in the winter, especially. So planes could easily have crashed into this and killed the pilot. And if there was a passenger and damaged the church, never happened because of that warning light. It's, it, I don't think it's ever been turned off. Okay, so that's the second fact. Anybody want me to repeat? Yeah, I thought here, okay. Here are two other facts about it that make this unique. See, this church is unique. <clears throat> it has a double transept. Now you pretty much have to use that word. There's not really any other way to say that. T-R-A-N-S-C-P-T -T. is pretty much phonetic. <clears throat> I won't hold you to the spelling. It's not on the syllabus. But you see this? That's two crossings of like the arms of a cross. So there's the nave, which runs way back here. You can just see the end of it there where this sticks up a little, right? It's a very long nave. But these two arms of the cross, the right word again, you should put it in your notes, is transept. That's, that's unusual. Very few churches have double transepts. Why would they have that on this church? Because this tower is immensely heavy. You can imagine, not only is it very tall, but thick and heavy, the stonework on it. I think you can tell from this picture. Those are really thick walls. So they had to have more support than normal. Uh, one transept by itself might even have collapsed uh, under the weight of this tower if it had just been right here. So instead, they put two, one on either side of the tower, and that reinforces the tower and, of course, the roof itself. So they needed the extra support, in other words, of, of a double transept. You know that that means this runs right through the nave and goes on out the other side. You can sort of see the edge of it there. So there is a double transept. That's not totally unique, but rare. I, I can't think of not more than maybe two or three other churches in the British Isles that have that. And then we have two more facts in, about the meaning. <clears throat> the wall, this wall, I'm going to go up close, is the original stone wall that once surrounded the entire yard around the church. They use the word in England of close, to be enclosed, like C-L-O-S-E. You don't have to say the close. You don't have to use that word if you don't want to. You can just say yard. The original churchyard is intact and the wall around it. You might think, well, what's a big deal? Isn't that true of all these old churches? Oh, no, no. There's a lot of uh, pressure on churches throughout the British Isles. You know, England's a very crowded. There's 65 million people in a space the size of uh, Illinois. My home state was 13 million. That means it's five times more crowded than the state of Illinois, which is not an empty state, 13 million. That's a lot of people crammed into a small island. So they sell, many churches sell off their, their yards you know, the yards around the church, it's called the close in uh, historic terms. They sell off some of the land around the church. You just say it that way. Most churches throughout England have done that, not this one. They didn't want to have the setting of this church be uh, diminished. So they kept not only the yard intact and some of the trees around them, not these two trees, these are younger trees, but they have some several hundred year old oaks and probably as old as the cathedral. And the original wall is intact every part of it, all the way around the entire outer yard. That's, that is, I think, unique. 
But maybe the most amazing thing of all for, for people who visit the church, I've, I've been there twice, is that it has the oldest working clock in the world on the wall of the nave. I'll say that again. The oldest working clock on earth is hanging from the wall of this nave. It's been working since the uh, early 1300s. Even earlier, I think the nave was finished in the late 12, yeah, it's the late 1200s. That is over 700 years. That clock has kept time. Now, it doesn't look like any clock you and I will ever see in this country. It's pulleys and weights and Roman numerals and, you know, ropes. And it has to be rewound every three days by the uh, priests in the church. But just, it, it is working and it's never stopped working unless they had to repair, maybe, or replace a part temporarily. So just say it has the oldest working clock in the world, which is over 700 years old. And that's hanging on the wall of the nave right about here. If you walk inside, you'd see it hanging right about here on the inside, of course, of the, the, the walls. So it's pretty remarkable. You put those things together and then you have the final fact, you don't have to write this, but it's another fact about it that is the most painted church in all of the British Isles. Every famous British painter and many French painters even who came over the channel, you know, from France across the English Channel. So just say many French and British painters, famous ones. Uh, Monet painted it and um, Oh, gosh, you know, let's see, Gainsborough painted it. Uh, even 20th century painters, you know, are not known as well known. Just say many famous French and, and English painters uh, painted this church uh, because it was so beautifully sited or set because it's not been ruined. Do you see that? There's no modern structures interfering with the view around the church. It's in, as I said earlier, it's intact, the yard and the wall around it. Uh, so it has an unspoiled view, you could say that. And that's why painters love painting it. Um, Jay and Turner painted it. If you don't know who these people are and you take our 2.3, either from me or anyone else, you'll see what I mean. These are all the top painters of the last several hundred years in Britain and England, uh, as I meant, uh, <laughs> Britain and France. Uh, most of them came here to paint this because it's so famous for its beautiful uh, setting. <clears throat> Okay, plenty on the meaning. Formal analysis. Now, this is going to be hard because it turned into a black and white slide, but the original actual color of this is yellow, a light yellow stone. Remember, we said that was Chart Cathedral in France last week. It's a rare kind of stone, a particularly nice, mellow, light yellow, which means it is a warm color, even though you can't see in this slide. You just have to write that. Okay, and then we have, there. these are the flying buttresses. See, here they aren't as important to the building. They're there on each section. They're there, but uh, the two transepts do more of the supporting here than is usually the case with this style. Okay, so the rhythm is obvious with the pointed arches. If it's not obvious, I'll go up close. You see that the windows everywhere are pointed, as are the doors as the main door on this section here. Uh, all the doors and windows are. And so that creates rhythm as do the flying buttresses and the finials, these are called finials that project upward, right? All these little, there's lots of them. So plenty of rhythm. And of course, those elements are dynamic. The pointed arches, the flying buttresses, the finials, the spire, but the walls and the corners of the building are stable. The largest mass, pretty easy, the tower, then the nave. That's usually the case with Gothic churches. Those are the first two. And then both of the two transepts are equal in, uh, in mass. So they are the third largest masses together each each of them and then for space well i'll say it again the tower it's real space is about 405 feet tall but the nave is only 110 feet that's not very tall for, well it's not you know it's not a small height but it's nowhere near as tall as some of the churches we've been looking at so it has a relatively low ceiling compared to other gothic churches you don't have to actually write that but by comparison so just say it's a little over 100 feet actually about 110 feet the ceiling inside Okay, then we have the modeling from the sun created by the shadows, of course. The line is carved line. That you should say, because you could see that here on the tower. That's what makes it the decorated style. Uh, so there's carved line on the decorations and visual line around the edges of the building. Um, it's balanced. Oh yeah, if you stand here, you've got these two transepts and the tower across the middle of the, of the roof. <coughs> so it'd be balanced left to right. And of course, unbalanced toward the bottom. And then let's see, um, what am I forgetting? Anything, uh, I mentioned the color, the modeling, the space, rhythm, stable, right, I said 
stable in the corners. Okay, I think we covered everything there. Oh, texture. Sorry, I always forget something. Or usually, it's real rough stone texture and of course, real smooth texture on the windows. Okay, this is the last must know for tonight. But, uh, whoa, it jumped. That's not it. <laughs> I ain't gonna show you that right after. For those who wanna see some, just for your own enjoyment. Okay, so let's uh, do the last must know on the list. This is the Chapel of Henry the Seventh. Now in Roman numerals, that's a v capital V-I-I. -I. If you wrote the number seven, I wouldn't take points off though. It's not correct to do that. So in the syllabus, it's uh, Henry the Seventh in Roman numerals. Chapel, I think everyone knows, C-H-A-P-E-L, of Henry the Seventh at, sorry, long title, Westminster Abbey. Abbey can be spelled with an E-Y or just a Y. I'll accept either spelling and won't take points off, obviously. Uh, I've seen it spelled both ways, A-B-B-Y and A-B-B-E-Y, but I kept it to the shorter spelling here. Westminster, one word, is in London. It's part of London. W-E-S-T, one word, M-I-N-S-T-E-R, Westminster Abbey, London location, 1516. All right, you need to know who Henry VII was to understand the meaning of this one. He was the founder of the Tudor dynasty, and I think some of you have heard of it. There was even a very popular TV series a few years ago called The Tudors. You may have heard of it, T-U-D-O-R. They were the most famous rulers of England in the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance. So just say late medieval period, because in England, they were still stuck in the Middle Ages after Italy was already into the Renaissance. So just say late medieval England. The family that ruled several generations were known as the Tudors. That's a dynasty, you know, the word dynasty, right? So the Tudor dynasty was founded by Henry VII. His son was Henry VIII. Don't confuse them. Henry VII was a decent person. Well, as medieval kings go, he had a few people executed if they rebelled against him. But the point is he wasn't, you know, viciously cruel towards his own family, the way you all know about Henry VIII. So yes, you could mention as part of the meaning that he was also the father of the monster. I called him a monster. Henry VIII had four wives. Well, one died in some say childbirth by accident, but he had three wives executed. And uh, two imprisoned, yeah, and then one died natural child. But so the point is that Henry VIII is a totally different type of person, a very cruel and, uh, you know, evil is the right word in person. Henry VII, you, you wouldn't say that about. He was a very uh, popular ruler, and he built this chapel in order to thank God, that's what he said, to give his thanks to God for having made him king, because he had fought a civil war that lasted 30 years to take the throne against another family. So just say he fought a dynastic or civil war. You can use either phrase because they were synonymous back then. Civil wars were always fought between families as opposed to regions like our civil war, right? So just say there was a civil war or, or dynastic that's with a D-Y, war between two families and the Tudors won. So in thanks to God for helping, he believed God, helped him become the victor in that war and start the new Tudor dynasty, he built this chapel. It's also where uh, many famous royal uh, events have occurred, including the funeral of Diana. You all know what happened to her, right? It's horrible. She died. I was in Paris when that happened. Uh, in a car crash in a tunnel below the streets of Paris, right? Some people think it was deliberate, I don't. But anyway, the point is she died tragically. Her funeral was held in this chapel. Also, several weddings, including um, the first uh, royal wedding of his, her son, William and Kate, they were married in this chapel. So many both tragic and happy royal family events were held inside this chapel since it was opened in 1516. These flags, you could write this if you want, are of the different families who back the winning side, <laughs> you know, who supported the Tudors. Their heraldic, you know, flags of their family crest and all that. So you could just say uh, flags that symbolize the different families who sided with the Tudors in that war and obviously were rewarded <laughs> in more than one way. It's Gothic style, but it's our last new definition for tonight. And then next week, we only have one definition left. Uh, for the first half of uh, next week's class. Okay, but now you need to write this perpendicular style. I'll spell it. Well, it's it's on your handouts. I shouldn't have to spell it. Perf pen with E, right? P-E-R-P-E-N. 
perp one word perpendicular style. It's a short definition. It's a style of late English Gothic architecture. It's actually even later than the decorated style, but just say late, keep it simple. A style of late English Gothic architecture, comma, which uses perpendicular lines and decorations throughout the building. I'll say it again, which uses perpendicular lines and decorations throughout the buildings. In other words, even these choir stalls, look at them, they're very upright, right? I mean, everything is going up towards what heaven. It's supposed to symbolize the search for, you know, the, the place you saw, some people think they'll go after they die. In other words, you know, aspiring towards heaven, it's symbolic of that, but it's also just visually a very, uh, miss, what's the word, a very, um, hmm, I don't want to say misleading, that's not the right word. The style of, gives the building an appearance of being taller than it is. That's why they used it. This building, this is a part of the meaning now, so you should be writing this. Inside this chapel, I've been inside here several times, and several movies, scenes have been filmed inside this room, this chapel. Uh, it appears every time I've heard a tour guide ask, an English tour guide, English speaking tour guide, uh, how tall do you think the ceiling is? And people guess 50, 60, 70 feet. It's not, it's not even close to 35 feet. So it appears to be you know, much taller than it is because of the style with all these perpendicular lines here, right? And the decorations are limited to, you know, they're not like big, wide Gothic arches like you've seen in the French Gothic or even the earlier English Gothic like uh, Salisbury Cathedral. Very minimal decoration subordinated to these lines. So everything has to do with the vertical thrusting upward movement of the shape of the walls the windows, right, and all the decorations. So again, I'll repeat that. It's a style of late English Gothic architecture, which uses perpendicular lines and decorations on the interior and exterior. You can just finish it up that way. So this is, of course, the obviously the choir stall. That's not obvious. These are choir stalls <clears throat> where the choir would stand. They have to stand the whole time. They'll get to sit and sing. And so even the choir stalls have that style. See them? All the lines everywhere in the carved decoration above their heads. It's all perpendicular style. <coughs> okay, that's pretty much the whole meaning. Let's do a formal analysis and then we'll end up with a few minutes of slides uh, of the views of Paris and uh, close-ups of some of the scarier gargoyles on the uh, uh, towers of Notre Dame in Paris. Okay, but first this uh, is balanced. Oh, it's totally symmetrical. There's this space here. And here, because the ceiling and the floor are the same width, I would say it's balanced top to bottom and left to right. Okay, you can't see the whole walls, but it is uh, for space. It's about 35 feet high ceiling, though it appears to be much higher and a fairly narrow rectangular chapel. This is not the nave. This is attached to the back of the nave of a cathedral in front of it. That's Westminster Abbey. So this is on the back end of the nave. So it's not the nave. You can just say the chapel is a fairly narrow rectangular space. You don't have to know the width. I don't know the exact dimensions, but the height of the ceiling, I do know. It's about 36 feet. So this is about 35 feet. That's close enough of the actual height of the dimensions. And then we have the cool colors on the uh, stone of the uh, corners and around the windows. But here it's that light yellow stone we've been talking about. See, so it's warm on the lower walls, cool, uh, warm, light yellow on the lower walls, cool <coughs> off white, uh, uh, sorry, light gray, I meant light gray on the upper walls, warm brown on the wooden, of course it's wood, choir stalls, and cool uh, blue and white tile on the floor. So it's a mixture of cool and warm throughout. It's a quite beautiful space. If you ever go to London, this is a part of, a lot of tourists don't go back here. They just go in the front part of the church to see the graves of Shakespeare and things like that. Uh, and where the throne is, where the kings are always crowned, that, that's in the front. But this is worth the uh, extra time to go in the back and see this. Okay, so the real textures of uh, rough wood, rough stone, smooth glass, and smooth tile on the floors. So four textures, two smooth, all real and two rough ones in the bottom portions of the walls and the choir stalls. Of course, it's warm. I already said that, right? Sorry. There's modeling uh, from the sun, uh, yeah, obviously from coming in through the windows. It creates the natural modeling. There's no technique for modeling. The line here is both carved, as you can see on the walls, and visual. 
around the windows. The rhythm is obvious with repeated pointed arches, the pointed arch doors, the choir stalls, the uh, floor tiles. The largest mass, well, I already said that, right. Actually, no, I didn't. I said it was balanced. The largest mass is the two uh, long or side walls, right? The walls on the side of the, the chapel on either side. And then it would be the ceiling. It's a slightly larger mass because a uh, mass than the floor because it's so ornate, so carved with wood. You can't see them for the stone decorations. You don't need to see them for this. Don't think I have a view that shows that. No, I don't. Okay, so we'll just say that the ceiling is a larger or heavier mass than the floor would be the third largest. After the walls on either side first, then the ceiling, then the floor. Um, a line, let's see, balanced um, rhythm, stable, right? I think I covered everything. Yeah, pretty sure. Uh, anything anybody has questions about, I'm now going to... Um, what were the two things on the side again that you oh uh, well you mean of the the masses yeah yeah the largest masses are the two side walls oh okay the sides okay. of the chapel because it's very long narrow chapel uh okay so now i'm going to see if i can do a new share that doesn't always work sometimes i have to back out and go all the way back to um yeah i have to do that okay let's do this i'm gonna you know just so I hit stop share for that. And now I'm going to do, hang on, exit full screen. It'll take me about 90 seconds. We I've done it before. <clears throat> okay, so what we're gonna see is the um, Gothic uh, Cathedral of Notre Dame. There they are, Notre Dame gargoyles. And I hope that this will, I hope, <laughs> can you guys see this? Uh, no, we uh, only see you. I see you. Oh, okay. I understand. <laughs> I know what. Ha yeah. Okay. Hang on. I know what to do. Yeah, I had to do this before. Um, I have to hit uh, share screen. So let's do that. Okay. To share the screen, I have to hit the full. Where is it? Enter full screen. Let's hope this works. It did before, right? When we did this. I hope it, you can see it now. It says you are screen sharing. Can people see it? Yes, we can. Good. All right. Let's keep this just to a few minutes, but I think you'll be glad you stayed for those who did. Here's what it looks like to climb up the towers. There are no elevators. It's 200 feet from the floor to this uh, balcony or, or you know, uh, parapet is the right word here. And if you ever saw any of the film versions, cartoon, Disney version, or otherwise of the Unspack of Notre Dame, he supposedly swung from these gargoyles. <laughs> Uh, no one could do that. These are the real things. These are gargoyles that some of them have been restored. And here we go, get up close. This is an old 700 year old, sorry, hello? Oh, this is a 700 year old uh, gargoyle. It's missing its head because it's worn down by pollution and you know wind and rain. I mean, 700 years is a long time. So they were restored in the 1800s and you're gonna see uh, how up close, the original gargoyles were, were uh, cast you know, and then reset in concrete because the originals were of stone, but it's soft stone, sandstone, which is easy to carve, but it, of course, tends to deteriorate. So let's take a walk around this parapet. You see, look at this. These are the kinds of creatures that, you know what gargoyles purpose, anybody? What, what's the reason that they use gargoyles? Anybody know? Some of you may know on a, ancient Gothic churches or medieval. They had a belief about gargoyles. Okay, they thought they were, you know, so ugly and, and scary, these images, that they could scare away or keep away evil spirits from entering the building. So that's why they were supposed to be so ugly. This is typically French. He's eating grapes, wine grapes, probably, right? He's going to get drunk. And then this one here is the devil with spiked horns, but one horn has come off over the centuries. These are about 1840s and 50s, so they're pushing 200 years old, the uh, restored ones. But they are exact replicas of the originals. The originals, I'll show you, you can tell the difference. Whoops, whoa, 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 it always does that. Hang on, let's go back, here we go. This is the one that Cosimoto, in at least the film version I've been 
telling everyone in every class I teach, if you only watch one film version of the story of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, watch the first one. It was a black and white movie. I know for some people, oh, I don't want to waste time. It's so well done. You won't even think about it being not in color. It was done right before World War II. They couldn't have filmed it a year later in 1939, just before Hitler invaded France. And it's with Charles Lawton, one of the all-time greatest. He won three Academy Awards. Not many actors have that claim. One of which was for playing Quasimodo in, in that film. And he holds this his arm around this gargoyle at the end of that movie and says in a very sad, plaintive voice, why was I not made of stone as the, of course, meaning his life was terribly full of pain. There was such a person. I think I told you that more than once. And yet we know the story with the gypsy and all that, you know, him saving her and the saying that that's, that's of course a fiction. Okay. So let's see, did I, I don't think I skipped one here. No, I did. So let's keep going. Cause when you get up close to some of the older ones, uh, there, that's the one that Quasimodo put his arm around <laughs> at the end of the first film version of the story. Now here, these, uh, this one here is probably original. Look at this. He's eating, uh, it looks like a rubber chicken, <laughs> you know, a prop from a stand-up comic act, right? Or something. That's what people were saying when I was standing there taking this picture. He's biting the head off a chicken, okay? And he does look demonic, doesn't he? Devilish. Yeah, isn't that? And then this guy is, uh, or whatever it is, <laughs> this creature here is a particularly uh, angry looking demon dog, I like to call that. And here's a better view. I forgot I had a better lit. Yeah, look at his demonic expression there. <laughs> okay. But now we're going to see these are the original ones here. These have faded, but they somehow survived. I think you can tell they haven't been restored. They're 700 plus years old. And these are less. This one here looks like a normal human being from the back of their head with you know their hair and their neck. I can't remember if the face was fairly normal looking. But an elephant, uh, that's news to me. You know what it is? I found out later. It was after the French started having colonies in Asia. I don't know if you know, Vietnam was a French colony long before we foolishly got into a war there. <laughs> Uh, which several of my high school friends had to fight in. And <clears throat> anyway, the point is that elephants weren't something the French would have thought to put on a Gothic church in the 1200s. But by the 1800s, when it was restored, they had colonies in, in Asia and Africa. So they put this elephant there later. But that's also original. And then here's your tall tapering spire. We're going to see it uh, up close. And we have like about five more slides. Whoa, I keep doing that, hitting it too fast. There are the gargoyles that can, this is not a myth, they have openings, their spouts, their water or rain spouts during normal, you know, rainy weather. But if the church was attacked, oh, it was, it was attacked several times, not, you know, by a crowd trying to get Quasimoto, that's in the novel. But during the uh, Middle Ages, sometimes peasants got angry at the Catholic Church for being part of the oppressor class which not all Catholic priests were. Many of them tried to help poor people, but uh, sometimes the bishops or the higher ranking ones did, you know, not do anything to help the poor when the, that's what, of course, the Bible supposedly tells them that the, the, you know, a teachings of the Bible supposed to be about. So some of them got angry and attacked this and other churches. And during the French Revolution, as I've already said, many churches, including this one, were attacked by angry mobs, but this one was never entered by a mob because this is the truth, they could, the priests, go up here with hot boiling oil or just boiling water even would maybe do the trick and pour it into the conduits, right? They're conduits lining, you know, inside the uh, parapet here. Uh, and then this spout, right? There's a pipe leading right through the mouth and then out comes spewing tons or, you know, I don't know, anyway, just a whole giant kettle. Those kettles could, could hold hundreds of gallons of uh, hot boiling liquid, whatever it was, oil or, or um, flaming liquid even, or, or, or boiling water. And of course, if the crowd below isn't know they're about to be showered with something hot and boiling, they're not going to stand around once that hits them. So this actually was occasionally used to defend the church, uh, these these guards, and not just this church, but others. And you can see how these are supposed to be so ugly, the faces on them, here we'll go up close again, that they could perhaps conceivably scare away an evil spirit. But what are these? Well, I'm not going to get too scatological here, 
but these were designed by a later bishop. They were added to this part of the church, and I'll give you just one little clue without getting myself in trouble here. They have something to do with human fertility, but whoever designed them, all I can say is it was really ballsy of them to put them there. Okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Hopefully it didn't upset anybody. Yeah, okay, here we go. Inside the bell tower is the biggest bell ever cast, I think in the world, certainly in the Middle Ages. It's the big Bertha that was in the you know, various film versions of uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, where he jumps on this bell and it takes minutes and it does. The clapper takes five minutes to where it finally is swung hard, uh, far enough, it's so heavy, to hit the bell and start making a noise. Well, guess what? Among these tourists, these were French school kids, they thought they didn't have to cover their ears. I'm so glad I had a friend with me from Paris who told me, you better cover your ears. Anybody been to a rock concert, especially like, well, when I used to go, I went twice to Rolling Stones concerts and sat in the front four or five rows. You don't hear well after that for a long time. If you don't cover your ears, you're going to be temporarily deaf. It's so loud. It's the loudest bell in the world. The original 700-year-old bell and several other smaller ones around it are all still intact, and they still ring them several times a day. And here are the views of Paris. We'll end with about six more shots. That's their pantheon, uh, not like the one in Rome, but named after the same idea. And inside are buried many of the most famous writers, scientists, philosophers, and, and painters in French history. And this is the Latin Quarter, where they called that because everyone had to learn Latin in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. If you were a college student, you had to learn Latin, and, and you were taught at Latin. So they called this where the students used to be, and it's still the University of Paris uh, area around these buildings. Many of them are classrooms and dormitories, several hundred years old. This is 300 and, yeah, about, about 300 years old. That's early 1700s. And then you can see here, what I was talking about were the gargoyles. See, there's your, your uh, uh, conduit or, or spout, the spout is here, of course, the, the boiling hot liquid would go right down there through the, and out the, the snout and down onto the ground. That's the bishop's house and it's original. It's a late medieval house, probably not quite as old as the cathedral where the bishop, I don't know if they still live there, they probably live somewhere outside the center of Paris for privacy sake, but, but maybe they might still live in this house. It's provided by the Catholic Church for whoever's the bishop of that. Now let's end up with a view over the top of the cathedral. There's your added spire. When it was designed, it wasn't finished. The spire was in, intended to be just like this, only out of stone. Now it's been replaced by, uh, well, no, it's gone now because of that fire. Uh, the, the metal one was added around 1850. Uh, but let's finish up with about three or four more views. Yeah, I love this shot. Now that's the wealthiest piece of real estate in all of uh, Paris. Uh, the presidents of France, many of them have apartments here and yes, they keep their mistresses. And I'm not, this is it's like an open secret in French society. Uh, it's just the way they talk about their own politicians. <laughs> of course, we could say there are parallels here. In any case, this is extremely expensive. Uh, these apartments, you know, they're almost the most probably one of the most expensive locations is this island but you see it's not the same island as this one this is the first island of settling i mean sorry first settlement i meant this island is the first settlement or site of settlement for paris it's when the romans founded paris it was a roman outpost first and it was just a military base until uh, they decided to expand it into a community and it's been uh, the center of Paris ever since. It's called the Ile Cité. That's the French word for it. It's the island of the city. There's your transepts. You see how that looks now? The arms of the cross. Here's the nave. This all collapsed in that uh, fire. Well, at least the lead, that's lead, hundreds of years old lead, melted and it just got removed so they can now restore the wooden beaming underneath. Some of the beams did collapse, but only a few. So there's like an open hole somewhere around here, I think it is and the rest of the ceiling survived, but not the covering on it. And this entire spire melted and collapsed. It's amazing it didn't take whole sections of the church below it with it when it collapsed. I don't think it just melted in a oozy, gooey pile. That would be too weird. Uh, it, it fell, actually. I remember seeing film of it during that fire in uh, 2019. Okay, and we'll end up with a couple more views. Well, there are your flying buttresses, in case it wasn't obvious, but with those you know, open mouth spouts or spigots for the hot liquids to be used against. 
uh, attacker that they do. And then there's the arms of stone that help hold up the walls in this section. I already showed you the ones in the back. You know, like two more views here. Uh, this is the University of Paris. Uh, these buildings are all, and that's the city hall of Paris from the Renaissance. And then here's the Museum of Modern Art. Look how different it is from the 1970s. It's actually pretty nice architecture for that period. And then here's the only remaining section of a church. I'll end with this. I'll show you a close-up of it. Uh, another view of the streets of the French, they call Latin, sorry, Latin Quarter, on the left bank, the southern bank of the, the Seine. And uh, there are the skyscrapers. I was telling you earlier, see, they keep them outside the city limits so that it doesn't despoil in any way the views of the old sections of Paris. <clears throat> and I think that's wise <clears throat> with a city, you know, in a city with as much history as this. Uh, and then there you go. That's the tallest building in uh, France. It's about 800 feet tall, about as tall as the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco. Of course, now the tallest one there is the Salesforce Tower. And then here's a, a Gothic church. It's over a thousand years old, even older than Notre Dame. And it's been open for services every Sunday or actually every day for over a thousand years. And we all know what this is. That's actually the tallest structure, I meant to say. Structure, but it's not a skyscraper. It's a tower. There's a difference. Nobody lives or works in that building. It's just for uh, viewing platforms and uh, souvenir shops. And there's the river that divides the island of the Cité, where the uh, Notre Dame is, from the rest of Paris on either side. Okay, one more view of the other ones. And then we'll end with this. This tower, you might wonder, why is it standing all by itself? There's no church attached. Well, the explanation is pretty simple and pr pretty easy to explain. There once was an entire Gothic church. This was not a cathedral. The cathedral of Paris is the one I just showed you, Notre Dame. In each big city, there's only one cathedral, right? So this was just another Gothic church built a little later, around 1400. So it's in that flamboyant style. If you can see the flame-like decorations. Right, and what happened to it during the French Revolution? A bunch of people were angry at the particularly at the priest or or bishop. Well, it won't be a bishop; it would probably be yeah, just a high priest. Whoever ran this church apparently wasn't very sympathetic to the suffering of the poor. So a group of peasants got together and decided to attack the church, and they wanted to yeah kill <laughs> the, the that priest. And he hid out in this tower for days. He had food stored there and everything by using these gargoyles and having his, you know, rest of his, you know, fellow priests that were hiding out with him or, you know, trying to stay, you know, alive, uh, pour boiling oil. And then they ran out of that, just boiling water down on the crowd. So for a few days, they kept the crowds away. But eventually, of course, the crowds were able to storm the tower when they ran out of, you know, and, and the people in the tower were so hungry from not eating, they were weak and couldn't fight back and they stormed up the stairs of the tower took those priests that were still alive at the top of the tower and threw them off the tower to their death <laughs> and then burned the rest of the church down and left the tower by itself it's a kind of a you know rather gory story but it's a true part of french history that they'll tell you if you take a tour a guided tour like i did of uh, some of the sites in paris okay so thank you all for your interest and uh, everything. Let's, let's now uh, just say if you have questions, we're down to only two more classes and actually really one more after tonight because we aren't going to be able to do much with questions except maybe about extra credit on the night of the exam. It's just the exam and then we, we end early. So anybody have any questions now before I sign off or before you all take off about grading, extra credit, or, or the uh, late papers? The deadline for all of that is the end of final exams week um i do yes please go ahead mm -hmm. so i found the um midterm pages that i was missing oh yes uh, you're in equals yeah and so i emailed them to oh, you good recently. i saw those just before i started teaching because i got uh booted out of aol too but i saw them i didn't open them yet so I think it'll be easy for me to add that, you know, put them together. I hope it is. If if you didn't get them where it's only two thirds of a page on each image, the whole page is on each. I saw you sent me four or five. Yeah. So I should uh -huh. read each page. Right. And then I can add up your points and I'll give you an email and, and there'll be no points off for being late because I understand. 
you couldn't have done it if it wasn't on time, right? Because I, I deleted that uh, video, so it'll count as being on time. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad to see you being persistent and keeping after that so that you'll get credit for work you did. I always try to give credit where credit's due. Okay, any other questions from anybody else about uh, anything we covered tonight or the remaining uh, two classes? Uh, don't forget, you want to all be here and tell anyone who wasn't here tonight that it's a fellow student of yours in this class. They want to be here for the review, so you'll know what slides we're going to cut and what terms from the list of terms to know. So you don't have to waste time <laughs> cutting them. Okay, anybody else have any other questions? at this point? No, no okay. question. All right, well, thank you all for your, your interest and uh, your questions and your participation. All right, have a good week. Thank you. Thank you too. See you Bye. all next week, good night. Bye. Bye.